By the year 2050, Earth's population is expected to top 9 billion. The United Nations projects that demand for meat will double. But already, our appetite for animal protein is taking a huge toll. Raising the animals we eat requires vast resources like land, water, and energy. Fertilizer and animal waste choke the planet's oceans and waterways, creating vast dead zones. At the same time, industrial-scale fishing is devastating ocean ecosystems. In a sad irony, we're pillaging and poisoning the very thing that could help prevent the food crises of the future. Our oceans could become an abundant and enduring source of healthy food. But that would require some changes. So says Andy Sharpless, CEO of conservation organization Oceana and co-author of the book The Perfect Protein. Big industrial fishing has the ability to catch more fish than the world can, the world's oceans can sustainably provide, and in many cases that's what they're doing. It's a short-sighted practice. Sharpless points to three big problems. Over-harvesting to the point of fishery collapse, destruction of nursery habitats so fish populations can't recover, and bycatch, the term for all the unwanted sea life that ends up caught in the nets. For every pound of seafood, between four and 16 pounds of bycatch are tossed aside. Sea life that is killed and wasted. I mean, we are voracious in our appetites. We have huge technical capabilities to catch pretty much everything. So we have to be careful. But the way to make sure we don't have a problem is, is also well understood. The ocean is resilient. Sharpless says that with smart regulations, we can bring fisheries back to levels that are productive and sustainable. Here's the very good news. Most of the world's fish live in the coastal zones that are under national control. Sharpless says that if the United States, the European Union, and eight other countries put effective regulations in place, rules that limit overfishing, protect habitat, and reduce bycatch, then two-thirds of the world's fisheries would recover to productive levels sustainably for generations to come. In five or ten years, you can see a recovery. This works. Um, we can cite example after example. But Sharpless says that changing regulations isn't enough. We also have to change how we eat. The United States catches a huge amount of fish. It's ranked fourth in the world in sheer volume. Yet 90% of the fish eaten in the U.S. is imported. We are one of the wealthier markets in the world, so we tend to want the higher value fish, the top of the food chain fish, the swordfish, the tunas, and the smaller uh, value fish are you know, exported. One of the messages of the book is that we should eat lower down on the food chain than we have because those fish tend to be more abundant. Many of them, those fish are healthier for you, actually. Many of them are cheaper. The only barrier is that some of them are unfamiliar, and so you're not used to eating sardines, and so you don't buy them. Can we get people interested in eating unfamiliar fish? My answer is absolutely yes. There is a huge amount of wind at our back on that question, and it's driven by the kind of foodieism of this moment. There's a lot of interest amongst high-end chefs in experimenting with new food. There's a lot of regular folks who like trying out new things. It's kind of fun, and it's a more sustainable part of the, the ocean food chain. Bun Lai, out on his boat with some friends in search of a freshly caught meal, is one of those chefs who's leading the charge for sustainable seafood. So we have a fish on here. Tanya, you want to reel it in? Uh, this is the snapper blue, which is um, one of the most abundant types of fish in this part of the ocean, and completely underutilized as food. And it's also one of the tastiest fish in the ocean. We have to get a picture of Tanya and her fish <laughs> proudly displaying. The big one that almost got away. <laughs> At Mia's Sushi, his restaurant in New Haven, Connecticut, you won't find salmon and tuna on the menu. Instead, Lai serves more sustainable species, fish that are likely pretty unfamiliar to most seafood lovers. The cool thing about eating these things is that uh, uh, they're just incredibly abundant. The ironic thing is that some of these fish and some of these types of seafood are also uh, some of the most nutritious and tasty, but uh, we have a cultural prejudice against these. These are perfect. Traditionally, what we were doing was uh, feeding food that we were able to catch in rivers and, and lakes and streams and the ocean in our backyard. It wasn't food from 1,500 miles away or 2,000 miles away. You know, 
Great, so we got some of this stuff done. So I'm going to change this up. I'm at it. History is replete with examples of people changing their, their appetite and fish going in and out of style. Salmon, in my childhood, was a relatively low status food and was often served to dogs and cats. In Massachusetts, in colonial times, lobsters were so abundant that they were a very low status food. And there was a colonial law forbidding masters from serving their servants lobster more than three times a week. There's a lot of history of people being introduced to a fish that they haven't been introduced to before and falling in love with it. This, this happens over and over again. There's a huge amount of hope. This is much more doable, much more practically achievable than people understand. And the benefits of getting this done are bigger than people appreciate. That hope lies in the resilience and abundance of the ocean, a vast resource that has fed humans for millennia. Proper stewardship and protections could begin to restore some of the ocean's bounty. And that could mean taking a fresh look at some of its smaller residents. Mm -hmm.